You may be seated. It's so great to be with you this morning. So glad that, uh, that you are here today. Uh, I always count it a joy to be with you on Sunday mornings. You know that over the last several weeks, we've been looking together at this ship series. And we started by looking at worship, and we've looked at fellowship, and discipleship, and stewardship. And last week, we looked at lordship, the lordship of Jesus Christ. That even when death itself pretends to be Lord, we know that death is not Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Say it with me. Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's been the affirmation and the acclamation of the church for 2,000 years, that Jesus Christ really is Lord. There may be other things in life. There may be other things in our own lives, whether it's hurts, habits, hang-ups, uh, whether it's some great loss, something in our past that we're having trouble shaking off, whatever it might be, that is not Lord. Say it with me. Jesus Christ is Lord. And we'll spend, as Christians, the rest of our lives now living into that new reality that God has provided for us in Jesus Christ. Worship, fellowship, discipleship, stewardship, lordship. But there is one more ship we want to look at together this morning before we conclude this series and go on to the next series next week. By the way, uh, Pastor Jamie and Pastor Stephen and I are starting a new series next week uh, for several weeks that we think is going to be an interesting one. It's called, What's the Least I Can Believe and Still Be a Christian? All right? Uh, I get asked that question sometimes. And so we're going to look at that together starting next week. But this morning, the final ship. Some of you may be familiar with the latest, uh, uh, actually it's, it's, it's been around for 75 years, but they've recently released some findings from the Grant and Gluck study at Harvard University where they've been studying human behavior and the human psyche now for 75 years of, uh, among two test samples, and it is admittedly a bit skewed because all the test samples are uh, white males, but at Harvard University in 1939, when the study began, that's who they had and that's who they studied. One group of people were Harvard students who would go on, many of them, to be fairly successful and make a lot of money in life, and the other test sample were what were simply called poor men, struggling men in the Boston Massachusetts area. They've been studying these two test samples now for 75 years. And here's what they're after, something that interests me and probably interests all of us. What they're trying to figure out is, is, is what are those factors that are most important in maintaining a reasonably happy and healthy life? If someone were to ask you just at face value, what are the things, what are the qualities of life that help you feel like you've got a successful, fulfilled, or happy life. We might say a lot of different things. In church, we'd probably say, well, our faith in God would be one, and you'd be right about that. But you might say other things. Having financial security, maybe, or a good job. We've all heard that thing. Someone who loves their, their work will never work a day in their life, something like that. You know, we've heard those kinds of things. But what would you say? would be the most important factor, the key factor. Well, 75 years of Harvard research seem to indicate that the most important factor in maintaining a reasonably happy and healthy life, and by the way, these, 70, these men who've been in part of this study for 75 years, not all of them are there, but many are still. They've actually gone through about three generations now of researchers who've been running the project. It's been so long, right? They pull, they pull these people in. When, when they can get them in person, they get them in person. When they can't get them in person, they do some online studies every two years. Asking them, how's life going? How are you feel, feeling? Do you feel as if you've got a happy and fulfilled life? Anyway, the most important factor maintaining a reasonably happy and healthy life is, and you've probably already guessed it, quality relationships. Quality relationships. Not just relationships. And, and many of us have some kind of relationship. You have some kind of relationship with that person sitting next to you or on the pew with you this morning. Even if it's only the fact that you shook, you know, shook hands maybe a moment ago. And that's a good thing. It's good to have lots of relationships. Nothing wrong with having a number of relationships. But what this study seemed to find was that having a lot of relationships, being well known, for example, or being popular was not where it really was about. Or being respected because you're successful in your business or your profession or your home life or whatever it is people respect you for. That wasn't really where it was at. 
The key, according to this 75-year Harvard study, was having a, at least a few quality relationships. Understand that most human beings can never have more intimate relationships than maybe 40 to 60 people that we know fairly well and we call them good friends. That human beings just, aren't, just don't have that capacity. Maybe some, some very gifted individuals might have a capacity for a few more than that. But according to this study, it doesn't take a lot of those quality relationships, sometimes just two or three or four or maybe half a dozen. Having a few key quality relationships in a person's life seems to be the chief indicator of a feeling of fulfillment and happiness in life. In fact, Robert Waldinger, the clinical professor of psychiatry who directs the study today said this, the good life is built with good relationships. The good life is built with good relationships. And he would say that's true across the board, no matter who you are or what you do for a living. The good life is built with good relationships. You know, as a pastor, it's a real, I mean, a sacred privilege that I have to be with people oftentimes through the last days of their life's journey. I shared with you last Sunday that I had an opportunity to plan my father-in-law's funeral with him on Good Friday. And this last week, Tom passed away. And I had the opportunity to share with him and, and hear from him mostly. I, most of all, I just did was sit and listen as he shared with me the things that he thought and believed were important in life. And you know, Tom's been a fairly successful person on the outside looking in. He worked for Sidgo Oil Company and then went on to have this distributorship in Virginia for five years and all that kind of stuff. He, he's been pretty successful businessman, but you know what? He didn't want to talk about any of that stuff. You know what he wanted to talk about in the last couple of days of his life? His relationships. He wanted to talk about his relationship with God, and he told me about growing up in the church and how it wasn't, you know, he went to church because that's just what he did with his parents, but it didn't really mean anything to him until in the late 70s he went to a revival service, and there he said the points connected, and I took my faith personally, and he said, I don't know if you call it convert, it's funny the way he said it, he said, I don't know if you want to call it converted or born again or saved, or I don't know what kind of, what do you want to call it, Ray? But he said, all I know is that it's stuck. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? All I know is that it's stuck. And uh, he, he just wanted, Tom wanted to talk about his relationship with God, and he wanted to talk about his relationship with his family, his friends, the people who love him, the people who, people who are around him during his dying hours. That's what matters in the end, is our relationships. What did Jesus say? Jesus said the most important things in life, two great commandments, what are they? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And a second is like it. Say it. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's all about relationships. I want to say that, uh, uh, I will say one thing. This, you can put this in for what, it, the, for what it's worth it's category this morning, okay? So I'm talking with Tom. And he's talking about his relationships, and he really doesn't want to talk about his business or how much money he's made or anything like that that, we, that the world normally looks at as you know, markers of success. For him, it was about relationships. The one thing he did say about money fascinated me. My father-in-law never talked to me about this before. He said, there is something I wanted to say about my relationship with God that I still think I just have trouble getting over. He said, in 1986, a church in Tulsa called New Haven United Methodist Church where Janice, my mother-in-law, and I were going had a big fun drive, and she tried to talk me into tithing for the first time. And that was not their habit. That was not his habit. And he said, so then I got in a big argument with her over whether we should tithe on the gross or on the net. <laughs> right? So I said, oh, that's the time I know. No, I didn't say. So we laughed about that a little bit. And then he said, she won the argument. We started tithing. And he said, it's still hard for me to believe. He said, that's kind of when our financial struggles started to get so much better. And he said, God just used that. He said, I don't know what you want to do with that, but he said, I'm a I just wanted to tell you that, that, that I believe in that stuff and that God blesses, uh, has blessed me. And a part of that is that I think that, you know, I've tried to, to give back something. And he, you know, again, he just threw that. I'll just throw that out to you this morning for what it's worth category. He didn't need to tell me that. You know, he wasn't going to live more than a couple more days. He could say anything he wanted to, but he just threw that in. I thought that was fascinating. Well, Christianity, too, 
is built with good relationships. Christianity for 2,000 years has been built on good relationships. The vertical relationship as well as the horizontal relationships in our lives. Christianity has taught, and for 2,000 years the church has taught, that the foundational relationship in our lives, the most important relationship in anyone's life is our relationship with the one who created us, God. And that Jesus Christ has come to be the bridge to unite us and reunite us with the one who has created us, to help us to have a right, good relationship with the Lord. And when you look at the cross, you can, you can think of the cross as sort of that bridge across which Jesus has offered us a new life, a new relationship with the Lord, the one who created us. And for anybody, no matter what age or stage or, or position in life you may hold, we believe that the chief relationship of all of our lives is our life with the Lord, our relationship with God. Any human relationship is going to last a countable number of years. Our relationship with the Lord is one that's meant to be eternal. Secondly, Jesus said that our relationships with one another are very important. Our relationship with our family, our relationship with our friends, the relationships we have with one another, and how we extend that same grace that God has shown to us to one another. And that, that life is about relationships. Well, there's lots of different relationships, uh, models of relationships found in the New Testament. It's amazing how those early believers recognized how much they needed one another and how they had to get along with one another and had to love one another in order to fulfill the law of Christ in their lives. Didn't Jesus say, others, the world will know you're my disciples if you wear a big cross on your neck. The world will know you're my disciples if you come to church for an hour every Sunday. The world will know that you're my disciples if you put a Methodist cross in flame in the rearview mirror or in the back window of your car. That's a really good thing to do, by the way. But he said, he said, the world will know you're my disciples if you, you know it, love one another. And those early disciples spent their lives in the church learning that lesson. And they wrote letters about it. And they encouraged one another in it. And they talked about it a lot. There's a lot of examples. The example I want to focus on this morning is the example of Paul and Barnabas. Some of you know who Paul is very well the premier missionary of the church. He wrote over half the New Testament. We wouldn't be here today without the ministry of the Apostle Paul, but Paul would never have been without the ministry of Barnabas. Barnabas is a beautiful character in the New Testament. He was nicknamed the son of encouragement. Some of you remember when that happened. The struggling church, the first century church, imagine the calling that Jesus had put on their lives. They were all just, you know, basic working class folks a handful of them, not very well educated. Many of them had never even been out of their own town before. And he called them together and he said, you now go change the world. <laughs> what? And so in the early chapters of the book of Acts, we read how they tried to pull together. And they, they scrounged around all their property and they figured out what everybody had and they said, you know what? We're all in. And so they gave it all, and, and then they, they lived off of this sort of central pool of resources. And there was one man among them that seemed to have a little bit more than anybody else, I guess. He's named Joseph. And he gave, the Bible says he gave a field that belonged to him, and he gave it to the apostles. And it was the right gift at the right time to launch the church and keep it moving forward. And at that moment, the apostles gave him a nickname. Barnabas, son of encouragement. By the way, there's some church tradition that teaches that Barnabas is really the rich young ruler. That rich young ruler who had turned away from Jesus some months before, after the resurrection, decided he was all in for Christ. But Barnabas becomes a very important figure in the early church. Barnabas is the one that helps Paul, the apostle, find a hearing. Now, I'm going to read from this section of the scripture, recognize the context. The apostle Paul has been converted on the road to Damascus. You remember that story in the Bible? Paul was a Pharisee. He was an up-and-coming Pharisee. He had a lot of potential as a Jewish leader, and to prove his zeal, he was persecuting Christians as hard as he could. 
having them kicked out of the synagogues. He had some authority to even have them imprisoned, at least for a short time, and fined. And he's zealous about this, so zealous that he decides he's going to go to the synagogue in Damascus and look for Christians there. And on his way to Damascus, by the way, if you go with us to the Holy Land pilgrimage next year, we'll take you on a little section of the road to Damascus, still today it's there. On the road to Damascus, the Apostle Paul has this vision of Jesus, and his life is changed. He's a new person after that. He encounters Jesus first as a blinding light, and then Jesus speaks to him while he's on the road. Three days later, it takes him three days to get his sight back because the, the, the light was so bright. Three days later, he's wanting to preach about Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Talk about a flip-flop. This guy, talk about repentance. He was going as hard as he could in one direction. He has his experience with Jesus Christ, and now he's running as hard as he can the other way, but he's got a problem. Today, we'd call it a PR problem. The early Christians re remember him as the guy who was persecuting them. The early Christians remember him as the guy who was having them thrown in jail or fined because they believed in Jesus. So Paul wants to preach. He, he, he wants to go and encourage the believers in the church, but they're afraid of him. They don't want him around. They don't believe that he is the real deal. Thank God there was one person who believed in him, and it's Barnabas. Let's read the story from Acts chapter 9, starting with the 26th verse. When he, or Paul, had come to Jerusalem... He attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and described for them how on the road he had seen the Lord who had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. You'll note that Barnabas himself had not been present for any of that. But he chose to take Paul at his word. So he went in and out among them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, everybody needs somebody to believe in them. Would you agree with that? Everybody needs somebody to believe in them. Say it with me. Everybody needs somebody to believe in them. The Apostle Paul needed somebody to believe in him, needed somebody to take him at his word, needed somebody to believe that he was a new person. He was a changed man. And the church at first was very skeptical about that. But thank God for Barnabas, who put his arm around Paul and said, Paul, I know that they're kind of afraid of you and nobody wants you in the church, but I'll go with you. And maybe if I introduce you to the congregation They'll, they'll let you speak a few words. Maybe if I introduce you to the congregation, they'll give you a hearing and maybe let you have a place within their fellowship. And so Barnabas encourages Paul. Without Barnabas, this is what I want you to see. Without Barnabas, the Apostle Paul might never have had a ministry. And without the Apostle Paul, who was the first to reach out to the Gentile world in the Roman, uh, in, in the Roman world, you and I those of us without Jewish ancestry, would not be here this morning. Barnabas changes not only Paul's life. Barnabas changed the future of the world when he befriended Paul, took him at his word, and decided to encourage instead of accuse. Is there someone in your life right now that needs somebody to believe in them? Do you know somebody who needs somebody to believe in them? Everybody needs somebody to believe in them. Could you be that person? Could you be the person to sort of go out on a limb a little bit, take a risk or two, to believe in somebody that needs someone to believe in them this morning? You might not only change their lives, you might change history by your willingness to encourage somebody in your life that needs encouragement. Well, Paul and Barnabas went on to have a very important relationship that was very uh, instrumental in growing the early church. And 
I want to say just a little bit about that. Some of you have read about Paul and Barnabas in the New Testament. You know about them already. But they built this relationship that was based on three things. The first one was encouragement. Again, Barnabas was known as the son of encouragement. If without his encouragement, the Apostle Paul might have gotten discouraged and just given up, and we might not have ever had, you know, half the New Testament, the church as we know it today, and so forth, without the encouragement of Barnabas. Can you be an encouraging word to somebody else? It's easy to be critical. You know, I, could, I think if I, if I looked hard enough, I could probably criticize most of the people I know if I wanted to, and trust me, they could do the same to me. But we make a choice to encourage instead of tear down. Could you be an encourager for someone else in your own life? Barnabas changed the world, this son of encouragement. Their relationship was built on encouragement. Secondly, their relationship was built on accountability. Along with encouragement comes accountability. Accountability is an important part of a, a healthy relationship. In fact, it's an encouraging part of a healthy relationship. We are to hold one another accountable in love. In fact, you know, in the, you, here I go again talking about the Wesley Renewal Movements, but that's true. 250 years ago, when, when, with, when the Wesley Movement, when the Methodist Movement was still young, they found such great strength because they met together in small groups and they, quote, held one another accountable in love. What they mean meant was not in a heavy-handed, punitive kind of way. We, you know, we, we've all kind of probably been there. We don't want anything to do with that. We're not talking about holding one another in a heavy-handed kind of way. What we're talking about is helping one another become the people we really want to become anyway. And, and I have some people in my life that help to hold me accountable. I have some colleagues in my life that help hold me accountable. I can remember a colleague giving me an article one time from Leadership Magazine. And it talked about how to have, if you want a long-tenured pastorate in a church, there's one very key thing that you have to avoid. And the article said, if you want to be a long-tenured pastor, don't do anything dumb. That's good advice, right? And so I, 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 I'm not sure I've followed that all the time, but, but, uh, but we all need people that hold us accountable. I hope you have some people in your life that hold you accountable. Sometimes when that's happening, it doesn't feel very good. And it is easy to resent people who hold us accountable. But this morning, let me invite you, instead of resenting those people who are holding you accountable, give thanks to God for them because they're helping you become the person you want to be. They're helping you become the person God has designed you to become. Third, the relationship built on teamwork. Paul and Barnabas recognized that they needed one another. Paul couldn't do it by himself. Barnabas couldn't do it by himself. They were both very gifted men, but they recognized that they needed one another. They got together in partnership and they took off. You know, Paul made four uh, missionary journeys across the Mediterranean basin that literally changed the world. He went with Barnabas on the very first one. Barnabas said, let's go and see what God will do with us. And so they get Barnabas's nephew named John Mark, and they sail to Cyprus. And then they go on to what we call today Turkey, which was ancient Asia. That's the cradle of, of Christianity. And they begin sharing the good news among not only Jewish people in the synagogue, but among Gentiles for the first time. And God begins to use them to do this world transforming work as they work together. I hope you have some partners in your life that you can work with, uh, not only at your business or in your schooling or whatever it is you do, also in your spiritual life. I hope you've got a small group, whether it's a praise band or a mission team or a Sunday school class or some group of friends where you can serve God together. Friends, we need each other. And then finally, uh, and I think we have to say this because we all know it's true, whether the preacher says it or not, relationships are often complex. And there are times when relationships can be strained. And there are times when it takes all of your energy to maintain and to feed into that relationship and keep it a healthy one. All relationships in our lives need grace to survive. Isn't it good that we have 
an unlimited supply of that? Isn't it good that through the cross of Jesus Christ, you and I have an unlimited supply of grace flowing our direction? Maybe we could offer some of that to someone else. All relationships, every relationship in my life, and the people I know will tell you the exact same thing about me. We need grace to survive. Is there, is there a relationship in your life that needs a good dose of grace right now? The answer is probably yes, because we all have those kind of relationships. Is there a relationship in your life that could use a good dose of grace? Don't be afraid to offer that grace into that relationship, because after all, you've got an unlimited supply of that from God. Well, the final question, I think, in a sermon like this is, is this one. How can you and I build quality relationships with God and with one another today? How can you invest some of your limited time and energy and the resources of your life in the relationships of your life? It could be that most of us are, are spending our energy and our time and those, those finite resources of who we are on things that do something besides build relationships. I, I think not only do the Harvard professors, <laughs> you know, of this 75-year study, but Jesus Christ 2,000 years before encouraged us to take that limited energy, those limited resources of our lives, and use a good portion of that to build quality relationships with God and with one another. The Word of God gives us some helpful guidance in this. We're not left alone to try to dream up things that will help us build relationships. I love Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. It's known as the fruit of the Spirit. Many of you have heard it before. But have you ever thought about how this fruit of the Spirit are the very things that can help us build quality relationships? relationships with God and certainly with one another. Let's go to the final slide and read it together, saying, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May it be so. Amen. If you're able, will you stand and let's have a prayer together. God, we thank you for the important relationships in our lives. Lord, we sort of inside, intuitively, already knew uh, the results of that 75-year Harvard study. We recognize, God, that a good life is built on good relationships, but sometimes, Lord, we struggle with them. So this morning, Lord, we pray that you would meet us in the struggle. And where we're struggling in our relationship with you, we pray, O oh God, for your grace. Help us, O oh God, to be formed and transformed by the Holy Spirit and by the presence of Jesus Christ working in our lives. Lord, sometimes we struggle with our relationships with one another. But Lord, we long for those relationships that are characterized by encouragement and accountability and teamwork. We recognize, God, that, that relationships can be difficult and sometimes they require a lot of grace we're thankful that through the cross of Jesus Christ, we have an unlimited supply. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.